Dr. Peter Chan is an adjunct and associate professor at McKay School of Education at BYU, where his responsibilities include overseeing China-related programs and teaching classes in instruct instructional psychology and technology. He also mentors grad students and participates in China-related projects. Prior to coming to BYU, he served at BYU Hawaii for eight years where he chaired a program of instructional design and development. Dr. Chan grew up and studied in Hong Kong, which is where he joined the church as well. He received his master's and doctorate degrees in instructional psychology and technology at BYU and a BS degree from BYU Hawaii. Dr. Chan is the advisor to several educational initiatives between the US and China. In 2018, in preparation for the 150th anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, Dr. Chan successfully lobbied the US Congress to modify House Bill HR 5751 to add an important statement to recognize the immigrant workers who were mostly Chinese who made the Transcontinental Railroad possible. In 2020, he drafted legislation HCR 26 concurrent resolution honoring Helen Foster Snow, which passed the, U the Utah House of Representatives Representatives unanimously. Min Hu was born and educated in China, and she is currently a PhD student of instructional psychology and technology at Brigham Young University. She is also a Chinese language instructor at the Department of Asian and Near Eastern Languages. Her educational background is in Eng English literacy, applied linguistics, dual language development, and instructional design. Her research interests include computer-assisted language learning and designing for blended, flipped, and online learning. Dr. Chan and Ms. Hu are very interested in Helen Foster Snow, who they see as a unique bridge between China and the US. They have a, designed a course for BYU entitled, A Special Study of US-China Relations Through the Life of Helen Foster Snow, which will be offered to BYU students in spring 2022, so make sure to look out and register for that class. And the title of their presentation is Helen Foster Snow, a little known Utah woman who changed China. Please join me in welcoming them today. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, today is really a, my honor to be uh, with you here. And um, so I hope the slide will change to our presentation. So today we are talking about the Highland Foster Snow. Before we start our presentation, I would like to find out, is there anybody here who, who have heard of uh, Highland Foster Snow before? Okay, one person? Who, 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 who in here uh, are already quite familiar with Highland Foster Snow? Anybody who is, all right? Okay, good, uh, a few of you, okay. So uh, we can talk more about her, you know, if you'd like to uh, afterwards. Um, Helen Foster Snow is really a unique uh, individual. Oh, one more thing I would like to uh, uh, say too. Uh, for those who are joining us online, we actually have a special guest. I invited my friend, Adam Foster, who is the grandniece, a uh, grandnephew of Helen Foster Snow to join us. And so he's online. And so um, I, I, I guess he, he won't be able to speak to us, but maybe um, he's, he, he will type some text messages to say, hey, Peter, you're not seeing this right, and let me correct you. And, and so he's online joining us there. He's also the president of the Helen Foster Snow Foundation. So I want to tell you some of the main things that are happening about uh, Helen Foster Snow. Uh, when she died, uh, she, her memorial service was held in the Great Hall of People. Now, if you have been to Beijing, this is the, the major event, uh, the major venue, uh, probably in the world, you know, it's huge. And only the top leaders of the country will be able to enter and have uh, this type of ceremonies over there. But when she passed away, they have memorial service for her over there. And there are also two museums in China right now that are still dedicated to her and, and, and to talk, talk about her life in, in China. There are many books and magazines that have been published about her in China as well as in the U.S. And there, uh, there's a university research uh, center in China that's just you know, about her life. They're still researching on it. And there are TV series, movies in, in China. Uh, uh, that, that, that's about her. And there are conferences, photo exhibitions, educational activities that, that are still ongoing about her. Now, so all these things are happening for this Utah woman. 
And I, I hope the question in your mind is why, you know, who is she, you know, why, why haven't most of you have, have never heard of it, uh, heard of her. And, and so this is why, you know, we want to introduce her to you today. Okay, so growing up, Helen was born and raised in Cedar City, Utah. Uh, for those of you who are not from Utah, it is a city next to St. George on the southern part of uh, Utah. And she uh, w was the da daughter of Mormon pioneers um, on, on both sides of, of, her, of her family. And her father graduated uh, from Stanford University, and she pr he practiced as a lawyer in Cedar City. And the mother is a suffragist. She, she also received an advanced degree. And later, both of them taught at BYU Idaho or Rex, uh, Rex College or Rex Academy you know, early, early on. And uh, she was also serving as the Relief Society president in that area. Very active. When Chicago has the uh, women's convention over there, she was on one of the parade cars in, in, in campaigning for the uh, women's uh, right to vote. Uh, Helen later went to Salt Lake City and stayed with her aunt and grandmother uh, and attended West High School. And she was voted as the student body vice president. And the, the reason why she was the vice president, not the uh, president, is because in those days, women, female students, were not eligible to, to be the president of the student body. And otherwise, I, I think she would have been the president, but she was the vice president. That was the highest position for a woman. And uh, she, she actually wanted to go attend uh, Stanford University, but her parents find that um, if they spent all that money and sent her to, to, to Stanford University, that was probably not the best investment because it was so much more expensive. And so they sent her to University of Utah instead. And she attended there for a while, but um, later on she, she didn't complete. She went to China instead. And when she went to China, she was kind of like wanting to explore that uh, uh, gra glamorous uh, uh, or, or oriental charm and, and, and want to uh, write. She has, always been, uh, she has always wanted to write the greatest American novel. And that, that's why she wants to explore the world. And when she went over there, she, went, she met one of the most famous um, journalists in, in, in Asia, American journalists in, in a, uh, Asia. His name is Edgar Snow. And Edgar Snow, at, by that time, has already written a lot of things about China. And, um, and Hel Helen was so, such an admirer of his work that uh, he, she, she actually kept a, a lot of the, the clippings of, of his writing. And so when Edgar found out about this young, beautiful you know, woman who has already done all this clipping of, of his work. He was also very impressed of, of, of her, uh, by, by her. And um, at that time, actually, Edgar was ready to leave China, but because of Helen, he stayed. And, and they fell in love, and uh, they, they had a lot of things in common, and uh, eventually they got married. And, and so um, they were married uh, f uh, for a long time, you know, uh, the whole time that, that they were in China. And something different about Helen is that she was not like other American women at that time, or Western women at that time, enjoying those prestigious uh, privilege uh, treatments that they received. And when she was noticing something that is uh, in inequality, some of the things that are happening in, in, the, uh, in that area, she wanted to report it, she wanted to tell the world about it. And something that happened very soon after she has arrived in China was, the, was one of the biggest flood in human history, the Yangtze River flood of 1931. Even though the, 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 uh, the, the magazines that had uh, the contractor her, uh, the, uh, told her that when she w w uh, went to China, she should write about the oriental uh, grammar and, and, and uh, they, they want to write about you know, that type of lifestyle. But instead, she was writing about the flooding, about the suffering of the people. And later on, she became a, a, an activist and, and a humanitarian. And I, I would like uh, to invite uh, uh, Min Hu to introduce that. Uh, hello, everyone. So 
I would like to do a history background introduction for Helen Foster Snow. Who are familiar with what happened in 1930s in China? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, yeah, the 1930s were one of the hardest periods in modern Chinese history when the Chinese were struggling uh, for survival against uh, natural disasters, foreign imperialism, and poverty, Japan's invasion, and other challenges. But during this very tough period, uh, Helen Foster Snow just uh, played a very significant role uh, under such political and social uh, situation. And first of all, it's the December 9th uh, movement, student movement, and it's a, prote it's a protest against Jiang Jieshi. And Jiang Jieshi uh, was the political and the military leader of China at that time. And uh, this movement it just, uh, for, uh, was just for Jiang Jieshi not resisting the Japanese invasion. And Helen just uh, played a vital role in the movement. And Helen and his uh, husband, uh, Edgar, uh, benefited from extraterritorial status as foreigners in China. So they were accepted from Chinese law at that time. Uh, with this privilege, the Snows were able to assist uh, students in protesting uh, fascism and contribute to the student movement. And Helen once said, we couldn't have done anything if we'd been under Chinese law. A Chinese could have been uh, executed for even messing with such things as we did. So the snows served as a source of information uh, for the students or also provide provided them with the information that was generally censored by the Chinese government. Where, <coughs> uh, for that movement, about 803,000 students uh, were estimated to have marched in the streets on the night of December 9th. Uh, Hannah not only directed the demonstration, but she also reported on it. Uh, this particular protest inspired the organization of uh, 65 other demonstrations in 32 cities across China. So, where <laughs> is another very important, uh, uh, important event in in China history? She an incident in. Uh, in October 36, Hannah Forces Snow interviewed Zhang Xueliang. Zhang Xueliang is a general of the national government uh, at that time. And because her report could not be sent out from the national list controlled Xi'an, so uh, uh, Helen sneaked back to Beijing to file her story for the Daily Herald in Britain. And in her Story, Helen reported Zhang Xueliang's design uh, to work with the communists to find the invading Japanese forces. Two months later, uh, it's in December 1936, General Zhang Xueliang detained Jiang Jieshi uh, on December 12, 1960, uh, 1936, and forced him to agree to and the civil war uh, and align uh, with the communists against the Japanese, which is today known as the Xi'an incident. Where another thing I would like to mention about Hannah Foster's note is the Democracy magazine. Uh, the Snows produced a magazine in 1937 uh, it's called uh, Democracy, which was intended to spread Christian ethics uh, to the Chinese at that time. Uh, her husband, 
Edgar was intended to be the driving force behind the magazine. However, Helen just uh, took charge as her husband worked on his own book. Uh, the Snows had an agreement that Helen would do all the work for the publication and Edgar, uh, uh, Edgar would put his name on it as editor. So, where? Uh, another very important uh, history fact is about the Long March, where <coughs> uh, the, in October 1934, the embattled Chinese communists broke through nationalist enemy lines and began a long march from their encircled headquarters in southwest China. The long march lasted three, six, eight days and covered 6,000 miles. It was the longest continuous march in the history of uh, war warfare and marked the emergence of Mao Zedong uh, as the undisputed leader of the Chinese communists. Mm. Okay. On April 29, 1937, Helen, under close surveillance by the nationalist government, jumped out of a hotel window in the middle of the night to flee from Xi'an to Yan'an. Yan'an, at that time, it was the location of the Communist uh, Party's headquarters. And uh, with some people, help Helen successfully arrived in Yan'an. And there, Helen uh, just interviewed very important communist, uh, communist uh, leaders, including Mao Zedong, Zhu De, and many other high-level CCP leaders. And Helen was the only second foreign woman to enter the area and the eighth foreign journalist to have such access. Uh, in addition to the male leaders, uh, male leaders, Helen also interviewed a female communist leaders, as well as many common women struggling to survive in that uh, tough period. And she gave voice she, she gave voice to women, uh, women of China and made their voice heard uh, by the rest of the world. Oh, okay. The last one I would like to mention is the, uh, the friendship between Helen and Song Qingling. Song Qingling uh, was one of the most powerful women in China. She was the widow of Sun Zhongshan. Sun Zhongshan was known as the founder of modern China. And uh, Helen just is, uh, developed a deeper friendship with Song Qingling. And she just uh, got Song's help for interviewing Zhang Xueliang and have, uh, having the access to Yan An and also Helen received a strong support for the cooperatives from Song Qingling. So Dr. Chen will continue about, uh, will continue introducing the Gonghe movement. Thank you. Thank you, Min. And um, before I talk about the cooperative movements, I want to come back and t tell you a little bit more about the connections between these several events because they are they're quite connected. When you just hear about them, they seem to be individual events, but they are quite connected. Because the December 9th movement happened because at that time, the, the government that control all of China is called the nationalist government. And, and, and their policy is that even though the Japanese were invading, have taken over the northeastern parts of China already, their policy was not to fight them. 
let them occupied, and instead they fight the communists who are the uh, had the popular supports because they they were the revolutionists. The the, the nationalist governments were conceived uh, what were uh, perceived as quite corrupted, and so the the, gov the people were not quite supportive of them. And but to Helen and a lot of the college students, imagine if your you, there's a foreign power that has taken over a part of your country, you know, and your government is not fighting them. You'll be you'll not be very happy, and so he, she, she, and her husband supported the students. Some of them were communists, you know, they, they, and 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 in in that movement, and not so much about you know communism itself, but about you know revolution, about supporting the common people against the foreign power that invaded their country. And then the Xi'an incident is an escalation of that because at that time, the nationalist governments did not want to fight the Japanese, but even some of their the generals were not happy about that. And, and so the, one of the generals, you know, like one uh, 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 Min said, actually capture the, the greatest leader of the nationalist governments and force him to negotiate with the communists. Without inc that incident, the, 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 that negotiation probably won't, won't have happened. And Hannon was the only foreign journalist who reported on, on that before it happened. And, and then, you know, they used this democ democ democracy magazines to talk about the, uh, the, the, um, the, the Christian ideals, uh, Christian ethics, and, and um, that also, uh, to, to that po point, she pop published not only this magazine, but also a book that is called China Built for Democracy. Because for them, democracy means that you help the people. And, and so that, that's also connected. And uh, because of the, this position uh, uh, against the, the, the nationalist government, she, she actually had to escape from the hotel, climb out from the window. She was being guarded you know, by, by, the, by the police in order to go, we, go, go where the, the, the headquarters of the communists were and, and really find out who, who they were and, and, and interview some of those important leaders. And, and of course the female leaders and giving them the, the, the voice uh, so that the, the world know about them. And so I want to just show you that connection. And um, the cooperative movement is also one of the, and probably her, um, main contributions to China and to, to the world. And because it helped the refugees survive the, the war. What, what that, how that works is that um, it, it has um, the, the, the different uh, villages, different groups, or different communities, they focus on uh, doing uh, some type of economic development. But instead of having a one owner that owns you know, this whole factory, they, they focus on having th this whole community uh, just producing textile, for example. And then another community focus on making uh, something else, you know, furniture, you know, and, and all that. And so that these communities can trade with each other, support each other. And this whole idea that she, she came out with was, suppo uh, was uh, supported by both the nationalists and the, the, the communist government. And, and so that was very unique. And uh, both sides support uh, the, uh, her. And even later, when she came back to the US, she was also able to get the US government, including Franklin, Franklin D. Roosevelt, to support her. And, and uh, the, his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, actually became the honorable president of the cooperative movement in China. And um, there's this uh, famous colonel, Colonel Lieutenant Colonel Evan Carlson, uh, learned about this this movement. And it, uh, at that time, the Chinese called this movement as Gonghe, and um, so the Americanized version of that becomes Gangho. And so the the word Gangho comes from that movement. And the colonel was the one who, who, who called that. And so, like what I mentioned earlier, uh, she wrote a book called China Built for Democracy. And in that book, it really introduced the cooperative movement. And because of her work in this area, she was twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And one, one thing that's unique about her work in cooperatives is, is it uh, they not only happen in China, but also in other countries. Um, India was one of them. 
So, uh, just now, uh, I mean, introduced a very powerful woman. Her name is Song Qingling. And Song Qingling ha was a big fan of uh, Helen, and she has uh, copies of, of her books. And one of her books was given to uh, uh, Naru. Naru was an Indian, uh, famous Indian politician at that time. She wa he was in prison in a British camp. He was a close ally of Mo Mohanda Gandhi. And when he was released from the uh, from a prison, later he became the prime minister, the first prime minister of India. But when he was in prison, Song Qingling gave him a copy of Helen's book about cooperatives. And, and he was, when he was reading it, he said, basically, this is the answer to India. And so from that time, he introduced this idea of cooperatives in India. And there were the, the tens of uh, thousands of cooperatives were set up in India. Last year, now this, this are not just in the past, even last year, India started a, a new uh, government uh, cabinet position called the Ministry of uh, co Cooperation. And, and so they co start continuing these co cooperative movements in India. And so this uh, Mohanta Gandhi, and so Sung Ching Ling was the one who gave him the book. And yeah. Now, some of you who are from Utah, you may, uh, who have studied your early Utah uh, histories, you may know that when uh, Helen was growing up, uh, there were a lot, al already a lot of cooperatives in, in Utah. Like right, right here, you know, you see the Cedar City Co-op store, the uh, cooperative store. Uh, that was uh, uh, the, the, in uh, Helen's hometown. R right next to it, you know, was St. George. St. George also have these cooperative stores. And so, Helen did not say, oh, okay, I got uh, my cooperative ideas from the Mormon pioneers. She didn't say that. However, it would be reasonable for us to, to uh, assume that she has personal experience these cooperatives growing up. And, and so, um, it, it just, just earlier on, we, we mentioned about the Long March. You know, when he, she talked about the Long March, she also tied to the Mormon track west. You know, and, and so there, there are some of those con, uh, connections to, to, to Utah. And today, you know, we still have this sign in Salt Lake, CCMI, Science Cooperative Mercant Mercantile I I uh, uh, Industry, I, I believe. Now, so after uh, Helen has left uh, China, uh, she and uh, uh, Edgar, uh, unfortunately, uh, they did divorce, and she lived in Co uh, Connecticut. And throughout her lifetime, she wrote more than 60 books and many uh, manuscripts. She has taken a lot of pictures, and these pictures, most of them, are right now are stored at the BYU uh, L. Tom Perry collection. And so if you go over there and ask for the Helen uh, Foster Snow Special Collection, they will, they will have that, okay? And um, she, later in her, uh, her life, she became a professional ge genealogist to help people, you know, with genealogy. And that, that we, you know, people uh, in our community really feel connection to that. And she, later, she went back to um, uh, China in the 1970s and, and be on a guest, and she passed away in 1997. And at, at the bottom, that picture, that gentleman over there, uh, his name is Huang Hua. He was the first uh, foreign minister of China, and she was, he, he was one of Helen's students. Today, if you go to see the city, you will see this beautiful sculpture uh, on the main street, and there's also another sculpture of her inside the uh, SUU library. And in our own BYU uh, library, we have her special collection. There's also a documentary film uh, that, that was produced by BYU, as well as a combat uh, film, uh, which is an uh, outside film company. And, and uh, just now in the introduction, uh, we'll mention that uh, there was a resolution that was written to recognize uh, Utah in the Utah uh, legislature. And uh, this year, we are submitting it again. And uh, because last time, it only passed the House. It didn't pass the Senate because of COVID. They didn't get to discuss it. And so we are hoping that it will pass the Senate as well as uh, the, the, the government, uh, governor will be able to sign it.
And today, we also have the Highland Forces Snow Foundation, and the president is joining us online. And, and um, uh, this is a U.S.-based uh, nonprofit organization. We hope that we can follow Helen's spirit in bridging the people together and continue to do uh, friendship the, the activities. Um, today, right now, there's a national photo exhibition with the photographs uh, 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 the, the borrow from uh, BYU libraries that exhibit in China. This is a national level exhibition in Hunan province. Before that, a, a couple months ago, it happened in Jiangxi province. And at the same time, it's also happening in Northwest University in China. After Hunan, the next province will be doing it will be Hubei. And after Hubei, then it will be Shanghai, and then it will culminate in Beijing that they will be doing you know, these photo exhibitions to recognize her. And these are all national events uh, uh, endorsed by the national government. And um, just now, the, in the introduction, uh, it, it, we mentioned about this course. This course is now in the book. It's called A Special Study of U.S.-China Relationship Through the Life of Helen Foster Snow. We hope that because the importance of Helen, not only as a journalist, but really as a humanitarian, a, a, a bridge builder, we, we, we hope that others can learn about her life. Uh, right now, there are a whole lot more Chinese who know her than the people in, in, in her community who, who, who knows about her. And so we, we, we hope to change that. We, we hope that we can uh, introduce a, a, a new generation of young people, students, who, who learn about her, her life. And uh, uh, because, you know, it's very interesting. Some of the people who, who study Chinese here, who may have been to China or serve a mission, a Chinese-speaking mission, that it can be, you know, Decades later, then they found out about Helen, and, and oftentimes the response is like, how, how come I have never heard of her before, even though you know, she has done all these amazing things and, and I'm studying Chinese. And so we hope to change that. And um, I, I hope some of you will be interested in, in taking this course and, and I would love, love to sit down with you and talk story with you and talk about China and her life, and it will be fun. It will be a fun course. And um, so it will be uh, on Tuesday, Thursday at 2 o'clock. And so why is Helen still important? Because she brought different people together, even, though, even those who are fighting really in the battlefield, the communists, the nationalists, they, they were fighting with each other. She was able to bring them together because of the common goals that they have. And she surely brought the Americans and the Chinese together. And in her reporting, she was objective, she was non-political, and um, she has never been a communist. Even though later, you know, when, when she was living kind of like a hermit, you know, just writing books, and there were some Chinese visitors came and said that, you know, you visited us, you helped us when we were poor and downtrodden, and we want to support your life, basically. And, and uh, uh, one of our friends said that one time there was this Chinese visitors gave her a stack of cash, you know, in an envelope. And immediately she saw that, she said, no, nope, push it back and say, there's no way, you know. I have always been an objective writer, objective ob observer. I, 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 I am not going to do that. And when she went back to China in the 70s, she actually sold some of her stuff so that she could get enough money to fly to China you know, instead of using the Chinese money to buy her the ticket. So that's integrity to me. And so um, she's still honored by China and the U.S. I would like to end with this quote here. When Helen was going to Yan'an, there was a very dang dangerous path, and, and there were natural disasters, but there were also, you know, uh, fighting, there were bandits, there was, there's a war going on. And she had a bodyguard that was helping her at that time. And by the time she was ready to leave, she saw the belly guard weeping over there. And so to her, she was very touched by, by, her, by, by his re reaction. And, and then Helen said this, the great war between China and the rest of the world seemed very far away. Here was the scrutable Chinese man in tears as if leaving his dearest relative. It, this was grassroots Chinese-American friendship, 
Never would I do anything to break this special friendship woven of such a few uh, fragile threats in a world where merciless sword cut at international understanding and natural human identities. That was in the 30s. And some of those sentiments, I think, you know, is still applicable today. We have differences, but we don't have to be enemies. We can talk because the things that uh, we, are, we can agree on, you know, between the U.S. and China are far, far more than the things that we disagree on. And so, thank you very much for your attention. Any, any questions? Okay, yes. Oh, oh. oh, okay, sorry. Yes. sorry. <laughs> I'll swap you places just for a second. Dr. Chan and Ms. Hu's work not only involves traditional research into the life of Helen Foster Snow, it also actively engages with Snow's legacy of building bridges between the United States and China. Snow fostered relations between the two global powers as she introduced the Western world to 20th century China and implemented a cooperative movement to improve the Chinese state's overall economic health. Dr. Chan and Ms. Hu are working to increase recognition of this remarkable Utah woman by taking an active role in maintaining her legacy. Several programs and organizations have been created in Snow's honor. Dr. Chan and Ms. Hu are involved with several of these. Their work also includes developing a course for Brigham Young University that highlights Snow's global impact. Snow is a credit to Utah women, and her story is an example of women using their skills to alleviate suffering in the world and to educate others on cultures with which they may not be familiar. Learning about influential women is a crucial facet of women's studies. Future research may focus on Snow's cooperative gung-ho movement and how it was influenced by her Utah upbringing. Snow's impact continues to be felt in U.S.-China relations. Thank you, Dr. Chan and Ms. Hu for bringing our attention to such an exceptional woman and her global contributions. We'll now have time for a Q&A. Thank you. All right, I'll go ahead and start with the first question. And then after I'm done, we will alternate doing a question through Zoom. And then if there's someone here in the room that wants to do a question, we'll alternate between the two. If not, we'll just do Zoom questions since we have a lot more people online. So my question is, as someone who grew up in Utah my whole life and who has never heard of Helen Foster Snow, what are some of the reasons that you think either um, with social reasons or political reasons that maybe I didn't ever learn about her growing up? Yeah, uh, actually before 2020, I knew little about this great woman either. <laughs> yeah, in 2020, Dr. Chen just uh, called me and asked me to join this very uh, wonderful project. And he just introduced, uh, introduced this wonderful woman to me. And I think one reason is, you know, uh, just just like Dr. Chen introduced, uh, she would like to be an uh, objective and neutral uh, person and do nothing with polit politics. And, and she only would like to be a writer, a journalist. So she, I, I think she uh, didn't like to be a famous person known by the by by the by the United States or by the Chinese. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think. Okay, I would also like to add that um, remember when she came back later on. Now, when she was in China, uh, even the communists were were allies with the U.S. And, and later on, there was actually a a Dixie mission by the U.S. military set up inside the the communist headquarters. 
but then after that, uh, they, they became, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they did not talk to each other anymore. And, and we had the, the, the McCarthy era, you know, where um, it's, it's not popular to, to be affiliated with the communists in any way. And so she kept herself very low profiles. And you were not the only one who haven't heard about Helen, even her family did not know much about what she has done in China until the recent years. And so, like, like Ed, if Adam can, can speak, uh, he will have told you that he didn't uh, learn about uh, Helen until just a few years ago, and, and th that's okay. But the more we learn about her, the more we, we think that this is really a remarkable woman that so we can learn from her in many areas. mentioned that she helped a lot with the co-ops. Mm -hmm. What was her role in helping establish those oh. cooperatives? Oh, very good. Yeah. Uh, her main role was to introduce the concepts, you know, to explain to people what it was and, and how it, it could work. And later, she basically wrote all the details on how to do it in, in this whole, whole book. It's called China Built for Democracy. And, and so using that as an instrument, and, and that's why this cooperative movement was able to spread to not only within China, but India, Korea, the Philippines, and even to, to some European countries. Thank you. And when she went to China, actually the Indians call her, uh, the Indian uh, news call her the mother of cooperatives. Thank you. So now we have a question from Zoom. That was an okay. amazing explanation. And this question is, Helen clearly had an amazing talent for bringing people together. How can we be better at diffusing tension and bringing people together following her example? Well, that's a great question, and maybe I mean we'll have some insights to that too. Yeah, uh, but uh, what I think is that for every people or whatever you stand for, even you know as divisive as in the U.S. today, we see the two political parties. If you look a little deeper, the things that we agree on, ha are, there are a lot more things that we agree on than we disagree on. And uh, for those who are, or those of us who are members of the church, we have learned that we even we should g g build on common beliefs. Yeah, we build on things that we 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 common beliefs. He build on the common um, uh, humanity between us before we talk about those differences. And oftentimes, if you can focus on those things that we, we agree on, and somehow, you know, those things that we disagree on, they, they, they disappear, you know, because now we are friends, we trust each other, we respect each other, and when we talk about the differences, they was like, oh, they're not as important. And, and um, I, 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 I think, you know, that's, that's what Helen did, you know, he Helen wa was seeing that she, he wasn't, she wasn't a politician, she wasn't interested in politics, and she wasn't necessary to be interested in communism either. She was just interested in helping people, and at that time, what he saw was that people were suffering, and she wanted to help them. I'd love to know how you became interested in Helen Foster Snow and started researching her. Oh, okay. Well, I have uh, learned about uh, Helen Foster Snow, well, uh, actually also by, by kind of an ex uh, 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 accident. Uh, when I was a graduate student here, I helped the McKay School of Education. That's, no, that's 20 years ago, okay, before some of you were born. I don't, I don't know, okay, long time ago. But I was a graduate student here and I was helping the dean's office to set up a student teaching program at the Helen Foster Snow School in Xi'an, China. And so that was the first time I learned about uh, her. And then, uh, uh, you know, many years later, when I came back a few years ago to start teaching, I was talking to Helen's uh, niece, uh, Cheryl. And, and at that time, Cheryl was very concerned that people you know, don't know much about Helen, and that her legacy was kind of, uh, she was 
concerned that some people may uh, take advantage of her legacy and use it for other you know uh, purposes and and so I said you know I thought about her concern for a while and then I went back and, and talked to Cheryl I said well you know Cheryl I if you are, that's your concern maybe we ought to develop a course at BYU that, that teach about her life and, and a, a well-researched course and so that uh, uh, you, you really have the, uh, the correct information to back up by, by records and, and to share that with the students. And, and I, I thought, you know, she's such a symbol of breaching and, and I, I am very interested in, in breaching the US and China together. And, and so when I saw that, Many years later, when I came back to, to BYU, people still did not know, a very few people know about Helen. I, I wanted to, to engage. I wanted to, to do something about that. And, and so the course is one way that then we hope we can achieve that. Awesome. So this is a combination of a few questions that people have had on Zoom. Um, just talking about how Potentially, Helen, a lot of the publications that she published were sometimes put under her husband's name or his name was mm -hmm. attached to them. Yeah. Could you first comment on that and then maybe expand in and say if perhaps her status as a woman was part, is part of the reason why her legacy has been forgotten? Yeah, uh, exactly. Actually, her f uh, sh she is quite famous in China now. She was not nearly as famous as her husband well, during her time. And, and one reason you know, I concluded is because she was a woman. And um, she and her husband also had some in intellectual competition between them too. Like she actually c contributed a lot to her husband's most famous uh, book, Red Star Over China. Uh, for example, she interviewed the, uh, the, the communist main uh, uh, the general, Judah, and she was the one who provided all the, all the details, the pictures, to, to the husband. But the husband did not recognize her contribution in the book. And, uh, and she, the husband was always you know, upfront in all the coverages, all the, all the media attentions, and, and she was not as recognized as much. And, uh, but uh, we, we're very fortunate that there are, there are few dedicated her followers, her admirers uh, in China, like Mr. An Wei, who were able to you know, find the historical facts to support, that, uh, support her, uh, her contribution and verify that for all these events, she was really the, the leader to make all these things happen. And, and so we, we are, we're grateful for that. Um, you mentioned that Helen Foster Snow used her privilege because she was exempt from Chinese law to help organize the student movement. What were some other ways that she used her privilege to help others in China and across Asia um, in promoting cooperation? Yeah, very good. Uh, at, at that time, you know, the Westerners in China uh, uh, and, and also in many parts of the world, they, they really uh, enjoyed uh, uh, special privileges. And uh, one way that she, she, she used that privilege to the benefits of the people, and she used it very boldly. Just now I mentioned about how she escaped from the window you know, of that hotel, right? At that time, the, the government actually sent two guards to be guarding at the entrance of the hotel to, to prevent her from, from leaving the, 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 the hotel. That's why she climbed out from the windows. But after she climbed out of the window, you know what, what she did? So, so she was so daring. She actually went back to the front of the hotel and, and thinking that, you know, maybe the, the two guards did not recognize her by face, just recognize her as a Western woman and, and asked, actually asked the guards to, to get a rickshaw, you know, for, for her to, to escape. And, and, and so, so that's, that's what she did. And during the December 9th movement, she also used her own home to, as the safe, the safe house for a lot of these student, student uh, leaders. Uh, like, for example, one of the female student leaders later recall how they, 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 the husband and wife, uh, the Snow, hit her in, in the closet, you know, when there were some guards knocking on the door trying to find out if there are any student leaders in their home. And they have had many meetings in, in, in her home. And... Um, when she uh, want, went to went to Xi'an and, and, and interviewed the young marshal, if she was not a uh, foreign journalist, I actually don't know if there's any Chinese journalist that, that interviewed him. And so, so she was 
she might be the only journalist, period, you know, who interviewed Yang Maso. And so she did use that privilege in, uh, in, in a very bold way. Okay. Um, so another question we have is, oh, do you want to Okay. Is how is the Democrat how was the Democratic magazine they started viewed sorry, how is the Democratic magazine they started viewed today in communist China? Is it considered to go against China Chinese beliefs or accepted for Judeo Christian beliefs and not a political challenge to the Communist Party? Well, I, I was tell you that the word democracy is something that you heard very often from Chinese uh, government speeches and policies. And, and the reason for that is that they, they go back, uh, the, the, when, when they're talking about democracy, they are not just talking about you know, uh, uh, one vote for, for a person and voting for the president. They're talking about the access to, to, to basic uh, um, things in, in, in life that, that everybody should, should have that equal right, equal access. And so, so er everybody should, should have safety, should, should have uh, security and, and food and clothing and, and those, those basic things. Those, those to Helen, when Helen was talking of, uh, about democracy, she often also, first, that's why she named the book title, uh, China Built for Democracy, but then talk about how uh, this economic model, because y y before, you know, we talk about e election and voting for the ne next government, we have to make sure everybody has food, everybody has clothing, everybody has the, the, the basic needs you know, of, of their lives. And, and so that basic value in de democracy is something that you know, we, we don't hear very much uh, today, but, but that's something that they, they can agree on. And so uh, the, just now you, you couldn't read it, but on the magazine uh, the cover, the first writer, first article writer was Zhou Enlai. She, he was the first uh, prime minister of China. And, and so they, they still, you know, really highly regard that. So, leave it alone. As a Chinese wonder, I've never heard of her in my own country either. Um, I just wonder how is that, that the news don't report her and stuff in just about everywhere in China, like, is, like, I would say it's true for most Chinese that they don't, they don't find out stuff about their own country until they go to another country. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So how come is that, you know, sh even though she is technically famous in the educational world, that she is very foreign to the common people? Yeah, okay. Well, sometimes you can say the same thing about Americans or any people, right? They, you go to another country to learn about your own country. Well, uh, 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 Helen is, I always say that is quite famous in the kind of like the education his historian type of circle. And uh, if you are talking about common people, uh, you know, you, you'll be competing her with Jackie Chan and uh, you know, uh, uh, Jet Li, you know, and, and these stars. Yeah, you know, they, the Chinese, most Chinese are more familiar with the, the, the Avengers, you know, uh, the, the Marvel Studios than, than with these historical figures. But both who are interested in history, they, they do know her. And, and we, we do have very frequent, I think last year, we had about three or four groups of media people, journalists, came from China to, to come, come to BYU to, to learn about her collections and learn about her family. Her family is very supportive of, of her legacy now, and so they interview feel her. And, and uh, so uh, people who are interested in, in history, they, they do know, know about her, but um, I, I do want more Chinese students to, to learn about her too. You know, we want you guys to, to make use of her legacy. And now that, you know, you, like I would say if to, today uh, Helen is here, She'll probably be very excited to meet all of you, but probably especially excited to meet with some students who are from China and, and talk about her experience in China. And so if, if you can become interested in her and, and take the course and have a co connection with us, you will love that. We actually set up a, a student council you know, to, to do these type of things too if students are interested in joining. Um, and then just one last question. The relationship between the U.S. and China appears to be increasingly strained, um, and COVID has only made things worse. What lessons from the life and service of Helen um, <clears throat> can we apply to our international relations strategies with China today? Um, 
I think the spirit that uh, Helen demonstrated is a good strategy, good principle that we can apply to our strategies today. What I mean is that I don't re uh, agree with everything that China does, just like I don't re agree with everything that, that the U.S. government does. No, nobody agrees with everything that the government does. And, but in that framework, there are also things that um, we can agree on. And uh, I think one thing that chi China has a difficulty with is that in the U.S., U.S. tend to be like pointing the finger right at your face and says that you should do this, you should do that. And, and chi Chinese is culture that the face is very important. They would be kind of like, if we don't agree on this, let's talk about it here. But when we are facing the, the public, let's, let's be friends, let's be respectful to each other because that's not how we treat friends, okay? And, but also, the, for me, because, you know, for us, I, I'm not the national government. I'm not even the local government or anything. So to me, I don't need to get into the national politics. I, I, I don't want, I, I have some feelings, some, some opinions. It doesn't matter. It's just my interest. And, and, but, but my interest in politics is not nearly as important as my interest in, in bridging the two people together. There, there are so many things that we agree on. Chinese in general look up to America, you know, especially in the 90s, you know, they think, you know, that America is the promised land. When they see that American societies have so much bickering and so much fake news, you know, that, then they will be like, uh, well, should we still, you know, look up to that? Yeah, we don't know what to look up to now, you know, because we don't know what it stands for. And so that's the confusing part. I think uh, some, sometimes people uh, the, uh, from outside of the U.S., you know, they, they, they got confused. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, if we can build on things that we agree on more, we, we can solve more world problems. Okay. All right. All right, we'd like to give one last thank you to Dr. Chan and Miss Yu for this amazing presentation today and for sharing their knowledge with us. And we'll go ahead and close this lecture. <laughs>